Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the last of our sessions at this year's assembly today. I hope you've had a great day so far. There's been so much to take in. There's been so many fantastic things to, to hear about. Oh, my mind is buzzing. I don't know about yours. Perhaps you're sat in the garden with a nice cup of tea. We've got sunshine here today. I don't know if you've got it where you are, but I hope you're settled in for our next session with Shane. Uh, just before we dive in, let me introduce myself for those who don't know me already. I'm Sarah Anthony. I'm the Director of Communications here at BMS World Mission. And what a privilege it is that this evening we'll have the chance to ask our questions to Shane um, based on what he said last night. And of course, I'm sure many of you will have read his books and, and have some other questions too. Don't forget that you can um, pop your questions on the Slido link. I think there's a link for that in the chat that you should be able to see. And please do send those through so that we can uh, ask them to Shane. So Shane, we're delighted to welcome you here. Thanks. It's great to be back today, and I've, I, I loved getting to share yesterday. I'm actually, uh, you know, I know my audience, so I got my tea instead of my coffee here. I've got my, I'm on my school bus today. I, I think I mentioned it yesterday. Katie and I have been living on this solar-powered uh, composting toilet school bus converted to a tiny house. So it's, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, glad to be with you all. Fantastic. Shane, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. Uh, maybe start off by telling us what's the best part about living in a bus? Wow. Well, I, you know, the, the less you, you have, the less you, you have to maintain, right? So, I mean, I can literally give you a tour of this thing in about 30 seconds, but uh, uh, I, I love it. I mean, we this this apparently is a thing. My my wife studied this uh, schoolie movement, you know, where they retire these school buses regularly, and they usually are well maintained with low mileage, and uh, um, you can get them for pretty cheap. So she she uh, we we got this thing, and it's the electricity went out the other day, and no problem here. We got our solar panels, so we're in good shape. But. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love and I mean, it. we were we were going to do this before the pandemic. So um, we're getting to spend some good quality time with our family. And we've got all our blacksmithing equipment to turn the guns and the garden tools so we can just pull our bus up and saw up a pile of guns and transform them. <laughs> that is fantastic. <laughs> all right, Shane, let me pray for you. And then I can see the questions are already coming in. Perfect. Perfect. Father God, thank you for the chance to gather again this evening and please give us ears to hear what you would have us hear uh, from what Shane is going to share with us this evening. Amen. Right, Shane, here we go. The first one here from Reverend Philip John Vickery. Please, can you tell us something about the being of your community, perhaps how you operate together, how you relate together with others? Those little things that reveal or extend the kingdom. Mm. Well, thanks. And I, I should uh, say that, you know, the, the, I love these chances to dialogue. And um, uh, my, my friend Brian McLaren, he says, uh, we should think of this not as Q&A, question and answer, but Q&R, question and response. So I'm not like a guru here, but I'm really glad to... Uh, interact with your questions and hear your heart. And this is a great one. I mean, I think for us, um, our community has evolved and matured uh, and grown up over the years. We've been, the community I'm a part of in Philadelphia is called The Simple Way. I mentioned it a little bit uh, yesterday and some of y'all might have followed our work for a while. Um, and, you know, over 25 years, it's community, the forms and shapes that it has, the programs that we do, all that um, has has different forms. But w one of the things that's a constant is we're trying to find ways that we can be neighbors, that we can be out and get to know people in our neighborhood. We have block parties and celebrations almost every month um, that bring people together um, we do food distribution, things like that. But I, you know, in the question, I think there's this idea of like, how do we sustain that work? And about 10 years into our community, we created a prayer book called Common Prayer that maybe some of you all have used or bumped into. 
in order to try to keep our spiritual life, you know, um, fresh and vital. Uh, so there's prayers in the morning, prayer in the afternoon, prayers in the evenings, and a lot of the communities we're connected to have used that. There's also a practice each month that we remind ourselves of one of the core uh, practices of Christian discipleship so that we are people of prayer and action. Uh, so uh, this month we talked about hospitality to the stranger, welcoming the stranger as a core value of Christian discipleship. Um, and, you know, as far as like the structures of community, I sometimes think of those like the trellises of a garden. You know, if you don't have some structure for your tomato plants, then your tomato plants will just die. You know, they'll flop around and die. But if you have too much structure, it actually is counterproductive. It, it keeps life from flourishing. So I think every community has got to figure out what is enough structure that allows community to flourish. And I see some congregations and some communities that I think have a little too much structure and others that have too little. <laughs> uh, and then the last thing I'll say is we visited a community that had been around about a hundred years. And for a while, every year we would visit another community so we could learn from them and pick their brains, you know, and see some of their, their practices. And this community said to us, we said, what's held you together? Um, for a hundred years. And they said, there's a couple of things that we would offer you on that. And one of them is straight talk, talking directly to each other. Um, you know, Jesus talks about this a little bit in Matthew 18. If you've been hurt or offended, you don't talk about the person or around the person. We respect each other enough to talk directly to each other. Um, so that idea of, you know, straight talk and um, St. Benedict in his rule, he talks about murmuring and he says it's absolutely poisonous. And he said, someone who murmurs about someone else may even have a legitimate claim, but their murmuring is more poisonous to community than anything that the other person probably did. <laughs> so, you know, you hear someone go, well, you know, Roy never cleans up his dishes. And that may be true, but like what you just did to kind of, uh, you know, disrespect Roy by not talking to him is, is just as toxic. So um, and then the second thing, so straight talk. And then they said confession, creating a space where we can say we're sorry. And I, that, I think that's very countercultural, but very, you know, sacramental and biblical that we create spaces where we can say that we're sorry to each other and confess where we've kind of fallen short of who we hope to be. And uh, one really practical way that we've done that in our community is um, in the early days, especially we had a round that we would do of prouds and sorries so that we could say that we, we could really affirm someone else in something that they had done. But we could also reserve the space to say we're sorry if there's something that we might have done better. And uh, I think even just simple practices like that or like a daily exam and, you know, those things are really helpful. Wow, that sounds fantastic. The idea of a proud and a sorry. I really love the bringing of those two things together as well. That's, that's fantastic. All right, Shane, these are coming in thick and fast here. Got one from Michael. The Baptist church in the UK is in danger of becoming a middle class suburban denomination. How can we as the Baptist church in the UK re-engage with being good news to the poor? Hmm. Well, I don't think, yeah, thank you. And I think it's not a uniquely UK problem, but it may have particular struggles where you, where this person's asking from. Um, and I think recognizing that this is a common human problem, right? Like, like we kind of talked about this yesterday, that the most compelling cultural forces in our society are going to move us away from the streets where people get beat up. Like we said yesterday, you know, for the places where they're suffering and yet the gospel's gravity keeps pulling us uh, into the suffering. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, for people of privilege, um, for white folks, I think one of the things that we can do is be more intentional about putting our ourselves in places where we are a minority more often. We're used to, as white folks, being in a majority white culture. Um, but it's very important to be a part of movements and organizations 
um, that are led by people of color and that are not just multicultural, but that are a majority non-white. Um, so I'm regularly mindful of that, trying to be in places where I'm led by folks that look different from me, where I'm um, participating in worship with people who are different, you know, that, that are not all white. Um, in Red Letter Christians, we sometimes say, if it's all white, it's not quite right. You know, there's something that's off a little bit because we want to reflect the diversity of God's kingdom. And it's not just a racial thing, but I think particularly in our, our especially in the U.S. right now, the racial fault line is very apparent. Um, uh, but then when it comes to, you know, folks that experience poverty, that are um, struggling to make it financially, I think we got to recognize that no matter who we are, we're most comfortable around people who are like us, who are from from the same socioeconomic background, from the same religious background, speak the same language, um, know the same um, kind of cultural artifacts and music, you know, um, and yet that homogenous rule is very, I think, um, contrary to the gospel where Jesus says, everybody in the world loves the people that are like them. <laughs> right? and, and he really invites us to love bigger, to even love our enemies, but especially to get outside of the walls of comfort. So there's no shortcuts for that. You know, I don't, I don't think there's uh, any, any way to, to do that except by realizing that God's not saying to a hurting world, to those in prison, to those in the streets, come find the church, <laughs> right? But God's saying to the church, get, get into the world, go into the world. So I think we've got to be very missional about that. So thanks. Thanks for that question. <laughs> Actually, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit for us. It, you know, you, you talked about race obviously being a huge thing in the U.S. at the moment. We well, certainly over here, the events of last summer, they, they sent a shockwave, really. And I think there's been a, a much needed sense of reckoning and a sense of really bringing to the forefront some of the issues that sadly are the case within the church as well as within society. We've got a, a question here from Wayne saying, how can a small local church, and I suppose it's, it's congregation, make a difference to racism which is endemic in the community you've just you've talked a bit there but i wonder if you could you could unpack that for somebody who's in a, a small church perhaps um wondering what they can do yeah so i well the good news is that i think that small is better in some ways we can do things in small groups that are more difficult to do when we have large congregations that we're trying to shift the paradigm and the demographics of so a lot of times you know i i i really um uh, resonate with martin luther king's words when he said that the most segregated hour in the world is 11 o'clock on sunday morning when the church gathers for worship, often we are in the most homogenous circles that um, that we're in. I mean, you go to you go to the restaurant, you go um, to a bar, you go almost anywhere, and you're around people that are, look different from you. But in the church, we tend to be especially um, homogenous, and so I think recognizing that's a good start. But also going, you know, we're not going to change those big Sunday morning meetings until our dinner tables and living rooms and lives personal relationships begin to re reflect that uh, the, the authentic friendships that cross ethnic and social barriers. Um, so there's, you know, I think there's places where we can begin, but it takes a lot of time to build that trust. I mean, we got to remember we've got hundreds of years of racist history that we're reckoning with. And so we've got to, I think, especially as white people, be really good listeners and come with a, a posture to learn and build the trust that um, uh, we need to. Um, but that's that's why listening to the pain right now is is also really important. You know, I was encouraged to see that you had a workshop, you know, that I can't breathe or we can't breathe. And that's been the cry in our streets, you know, the cry of George Floyd and Eric Garner and folks literally getting the life crushed out of them by police officers in America. But it's it's also a cry, I think, that goes all the way back to Romans, right, that our entire creation is groaning as in the pains of childbirth, um, that, that we're literally, um, people are hurting and that hurting uh, has been happening for a really long time. And finally, I think a, a, a lot of people who haven't been listening are beginning to listen. And, um, and so, you know, when, 
when we affirm that Black Lives Matter, I think what all that we're doing, certainly no one's saying that white lives don't matter or that Black Lives Matter more or anything like that, but I think the ability to, um, to emphatically say Black Lives Matter is really important because so much of our history has said something very different. I mean, in America, that history looks like saying Black folks are three-fifths human. It looks like uh, in the Dred Scott case saying that Black folks don't have any rights that white people have to acknowledge. It looks like the founding fathers of our country that wrote all people are created equal, that they were still owning people as property and selling people on street corners. So, you know, I think that's where we can't say all lives matter until we can say that Black lives matter. And I think it's also, um, what Jesus was doing when he emphasized the people that we've crushed uh, in the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, and, and, and I think what he's doing is kind of affirming those people that our world has been crushing. And um, I can almost imagine if Jesus said, blessed are the poor, someone in the audience might try to correct him and say, oh, no, but God loves rich people, too. <laughs> Yes, of course, God loves everybody, but we need to be very specific about countering what our um, history has kind of taught us differently. So, yeah. Amen and amen to that. <laughs> I love the passion which, which you speak with and which you live by. Um, and uh, we've got a, a question here from an Ellen who I think feels similarly saying, what keeps the fire burning in your belly in the day to day? Oh, that's a that's a fun one. Well, I, I, I guess a couple of things. One is is that proximity, you know, that I talked about yesterday. I think that a part of how we keep a fire in our bones is when, you know, injustice is not just something we read about in the newspaper or we, you know, read books on, but we're proximate to that pain, and that really makes these things urgent. It makes them personal and human, right? So. Um, Immig immigrants are just not just a de debate for parliament or for Congress, but they're neighbors to be loved. And when immigrants have names and faces, like um, these things become much more, um, uh, th there's an urgency about it, right? That's not just in our head, but that really has moved from our hearts. Um, so, you know, just yesterday I talked to some friends and we've, we've got an execution that's coming up in our country. It's uh, actually the first state execution we've had um, in nine months. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, uh, one of those things where we got on the phone together and we said, we need to be there. You know, let's, let's get to Texas. So I got a ticket yesterday and we're going out there to be with the family. The, actually, the family of the victim is against the execution. Um, and so we, we want to be as proximate as we can. And um, so, you know, I'll be hopping on the first plane I've been on in the year and trying to raise our voice uh, around that execution. But it's when, you know, when people that were wrongfully convicted became friends of mine, people that were right, rightfully convicted and facing execution became friends of mine, that, that the death penalty really became a fire in my bones. So I think that proximity is important. And I also, you know, I, I really believe that our love relationship to Jesus, our, um, our discipleship of Christ creates that um, fire in our bones too. You know, we, we look at what Jesus lived and preached and um, embodied for us. And that, that gives me a, a lot of courage. It gives me um, uh, a, a lot of hope too. You know, I see what he endured and, and triumphed over and that, that allows me to know that death may look like it's winning on Good Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's interesting you pick up on the proximity question. I think this is one that people have been wrestling with. So a question coming in here from Laura. Uh, some, some or indeed maybe a lot of those roads where, where Jesus would travel, but where people get beaten up are all around the world. And uh, we can't live incarnationally in all of them. What does it mean to reach out to those in the ditch, to be a global neighbor and a good Samaritan, to those around the world in those situations. Yeah, the, the, this is really, um, it's, it's an it's a important question because I, I, Mother Teresa, you know, she, um, she has taught me a lot, but one of the things I learned from going to India is Mother Teresa would say, 
Uh, Calcuttas are everywhere if we'll only have eyes to see. So you don't have to go to Calcutta to find Calcutta. You know, she would say, find those who are lonely, find those who are the um, uh, outcasts, you know, the untouchables, those who are stigmatized in your own culture. Um, And sometimes it's easier to love people on the other side of the world than it is the people right next to us. So I think that invitation to find your own Calcutta um, to find a place where we can put our feet on the ground becomes really um, uh, an important one for us. And um, it's interesting that Jesus actually lived in real towns, right? Like that there's proper nouns in, 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 in the gospel, as I like to say, and those proper nouns are important. Uh, Jesus had a name. He had a place. He came from Nazareth where folks said nothing good could come. You know, he spent time in these little towns like Capernaum, I don't know if you've ever been to Capernaum, but I, I, I went there to the historic town and there were like, there were like a couple hundred families that lived there. Like this was a small town, you know, Bethany, these places and people that Jesus, um, the, the gospels are written out of. Uh, and they remind us that we need to love a people and a place just as Jesus did. And, and just as God so loved the world, God also made this flesh out in a personal way in a real time, in a real place. Um, and you think of so many of the saints, right? They became associated with their place. I mean, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, you think of St. Francis of Assisi, right? Um, uh, the, 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 the towns that people grew roots in. Um, so I think that's important for us to realize that change happens as we grow roots um, in uh, and among a people. Um, and one of the cultural patterns is to move a lot, right? To move often and move around. It's hard to really have an impact in a place. So um, yeah, one of, one of my memories is I had one of my mentors who's 90 years old now that came to visit me in Philly. And I told him we had been there for, geez, a lot of years, I think almost 10 years. And we, we were still seeing people shot on our streets. We were still seeing a lot of poverty. And I was pretty discouraged. And I said to John, who was, you know, in his 80s, I said, um, to, this is Dr. John Perkins. He's been a mentor of mine. And um, I said, Dr. Perkins, it really feels like um, things aren't changing as quick as I, I would like them to. And, and Dr. Perkins said, how long have you been here? I said, we've been out here almost 10 years. And he said, you'll start to see things change in maybe 15 years. <laughs> and he meant that to be reassuring. But I think that, you know, that kind of um, stability and that, you um, that attention to a people in a place is a good thing for us to remember. <laughs> a sobering, a sobering comment. However, in the meantime, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, and I think in a world with so much virtual stuff, you know, where you can sign petitions, you can um, be on Skype calls, you can care about the whole world. But until we really have, I think, fleshed out real relationships, then it's still. Um, can, can feel a little shallow. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about the leadership within your community. So this is a question from Alison. Said, in your community, do you feel that there is a genuine integration of social class or do the educated middle classes still lead? And do you have any wisdom to share um, on, on how that integration has been balanced? Yeah. Um, so one of the places that I've I've learned a lot about this is the organization that that Dr. John Perkins founded, who you know I was just talking about. He founded an organization called the Christian Community Development Association (CCDA), and it's all around the country. It's also all around the world. We've done conferences, and I think we we've you know had a lot of connections in the UK. And 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 uh, but one of the things that Dr. Perkins um, has talked about is how that restoring a neighborhood takes three groups of people working together. And he put, puts kind of a name on those as remainers, returners, and relocators. So remainers are the indigenous neighbors, folks that have lived there for all their life or a lot of their life or even for generations. Um, and then returners are people that grew up in a neighborhood that might be a struggling neighborhood and they kind of don't forget where they came from and they bring their gifts and skills and resources back to the neighborhood that they grew up in. And then the last group is um, 
uh, relocators, folks from outside that come with the right posture to listen, learn, and join the work there in the neighborhood. So I can see all of those kind of reflected in the strongest kind of community development organizations in our country and even in our own community. Uh, the folks that are leading most everything now are people that I've been that that have been there longer than me. Friends like my, you know, Miguel Diaz, who is uh, one of the first Puerto Rican families in our neighborhood. And he's now officially he has a title. And this is one of the cool things that Philadelphia has. He's a block captain, which means he's kind of a neighborhood elder. And he um, has some recognized authority from the city of Philadelphia as kind of our most grassroots democratic representation. So he can organize block cleanups and food distribution uh, for for our youth that's provided, you know, city lunches from the, the city and things like that. So I think all of those are really empowering models. And too often the missional mindset has been outside people coming in and growing up in, uh, you know, a neighborhood. And I think it's a very problematic um, kind of paradigm, you know, and a lot of times that narrative can be very, very hurtful to the indigenous people that live in that neighborhood. You know, if, if, um, and I, I had a friend of mine that told me, you know, this is many years ago, he said, sometimes the narrative gets twisted in a way that says, uh, you know, you all as outsiders came in to save this neighborhood. And he says, I noticed that a lot of your peers think you're heroic for living in Kensington, you know, a tough neighborhood. And he said, all of my peers think that I'm a failure because I haven't moved out of Kensington, the neighborhood I was born in. And so I think, you know, if we're not careful, then one person's dignity or their credibility or even their fundraising can come at the cost of another person's dignity. Um, so we certainly don't want to ever exploit, or as some of my friends call it, poverty pimping. You know, you don't want to um, raise your funding and twist the narrative in a way that um, makes outsiders look really great at the um, expense of the dignity of the people there. Thanks, Shane. You said last night. Sorry to your sign language folks. I, I know a little bit of sign language, but I am, I'm sorry that I, I go fast sometimes. I'll try to slow down a little bit so you can sign. <laughs> yeah, for all the sign languages, I know there's been so many comments on the chat just saying thank you so much to you all and what a great job you're all doing today. Virtual yeah, clap from you. us all. Shay, you, uh, you said last night that you're not a Baptist. Can you offer us help as British Baptists to help us move forward in our understanding of human sexuality? It's a question wow. from Keith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I will say this, that, I, you know, I, 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 I did mention that my family, you know, my grandparents were Baptist. And so I'm very familiar. I do a lot in the Baptist world and being partners in ministry with Tony Campolo. You know, we've done tons of stuff together. And there, almost every denomination that I've encountered anyway, I think has a lot to offer. Um, really beautiful uh, assets and it, th things that they're really good at. And they also, I think each denomination kind of has its own um, funk, you know, or its own shadow or struggles. And but one of the things I would say about the Baptist um, world, as I've experienced it, is that you're able to hold a lot of tensions um, because you have independent churches. You also are trying to hold unity uh, around things that you disagree. And now I know that there's a lot of Baptist jokes about how many Baptist splits there have been. So I'm not going to go there. I don't want to speak outside of my own authority as a non-Baptist. But, um, but I, you know, having that independence together with a sense of bigger belonging is helpful um, because I, I think on issues like same-sex marriage, um, I don't know that we're all going to agree on the sacrament of marriage. And I think that people who love the Bible can read scriptures and interpret them differently. And one of the reasons that this is a difficult issue is because Jesus doesn't 
explicitly address it. There's only like six scriptures that have to do with uh, same-sex mar- or same-sex relationships in any form, and most of them were about something very different than what we're talking about today. They were very exploitive uh, relationships, often from someone that's older with someone that's younger, and so all this. Like, so I think it's a very complicated issue. But the first thing that we can all, I hope, agree on is that the church has not navigated this well. We've done very damaging things to people who uh, consider themselves LGBTQ, you know, that are not attracted to the same gender. Um, And just one obvious uh, evidence of that in the U.S. was when the Barna Research Group went to every state in the U.S. and they asked young non-Christians what they think of when they hear the word Christian. Every state, all 50 states in the U.S., the number one answer was anti-gay anti-homosexual. Number two was judgmental. And number three was hypocritical. And as you look at the list, it doesn't get much better. And what struck me also as I read this was what didn't register on the poll. And what didn't even make the list of what non-Christians said when they heard the word Christian is love. And that is what Jesus said that they will know we are Christians by. It's what scripture says, you know, we can have faith to move mountains, but if we don't have love, it's empty. And so in the end, when we have become known more for who we've excluded than who we've embraced, more for what we're against than who we're for, I think we've gotten something terribly wrong. And Jesus didn't, you know, people didn't encounter Jesus and walk away scratching their head thinking, Why doesn't he like gay folks? You know, like people were drawn to him by the way that he was extending love and compassion. Now, having said that, I think that, you know, when it comes to things like ordination um, and uh, the sacrament of marriage, like we're probably not all going to agree. And that's where I would think that the Baptists might be able to hold attention better than some of the larger um, like the Anglican Church. Um, in, in the U.S., I even navigated this with one church whose pastors didn't even agree on same-sex marriage. So they may have one pastor that does perform same-sex marriages and one that doesn't. And this congregation's trying to hold that tension. In the Methodist church that I grew up in, we've just seen a devastating split where they weren't able to hold that tension and disagree. And so um, the the Methodist church is going to split over same-sex marriage. And, I, you know, there was one proposal that would allow congregations to disagree on um, sexuality and still remain a united Methodist church. And that didn't happen. So I think there's folks that there's other conferences that will exclude people who don't uh, publicly Uh, have a statement affirming same-sex marriage. And I think it's that line in the sand um, that we can't, we can't do anything together if we don't agree on this. That's that's really difficult. So in Red Letter Christians, we're trying to hold that tension. And we have people that are ordained as gay folks or LGBTQ folks. We have other folks that would uh, believe that the biblical mandate is that marriage is between a man and a woman. Um, so we're trying to hold those tensions ourselves. So um, all that to say is if, if we can't begin with a posture of grieving how we've hurt and damaged and excluded people, I think that's where we've got a problem. And I, I would also say, uh, you know, Billy Graham had a great line. He said um, that it's God's job to judge. It's the spirit's job to convict. And it's our job to love. It's a great line. And and I think when we um, get into the, you know, ourselves trying to convict or judge um, and and do the job of God, that's where we get into trouble. Um, So there's a whole lot more to, to be said on all of that, but I think that's, I guess, where I would start. So, yeah. An impressive amount in a few minutes. Thank you. We've got a a few people picking up here on your comments about finding your own Calcutta. I've got Norman saying it's hard to get excited about social struggles in a a sort of a nice village with no obviously dreadful problems. 
you know, my own village is not Calcutta. What would be your advice here? Well, yeah, so I think that there are a lot of ways to become proximate, right? Without everyone assuming you've got to move into the estates or into like, a, you know, to move to a, a struggling neighborhood. Um, one of um, uh, Frederick Beekner's great lines is that each of us needs to take, this is my paraphrase of it, but we've got to take our deepest passions and connect them to the world's deepest pain. And when we connect our skills and gifts and passions to the world's pain, uh, that's where we discover, I think, kind of the difference between just a career and a vocation or a calling, right? That our gifts are seeking first the kingdom of God. It's not just about paying the bills, but it's about trying to contribute to a bigger story of the, you know, God redeeming the world. And how can I do one little piece of that with who I'm wired to be? And, and then I think as we're thinking of, you know, um, that the, the question becomes not just, am I going to be a doctor or lawyer or plumber, but what kind of doctor or lawyer or plumber am I going to be? And how can I use my gifts in a way that liberate and that, um, create resources for folks that um, might uh, be on the, the, you know, might be struggling to make it. Um, And the cool thing is I've got so many stories. I don't know where to start on people that I've seen do that. You know, I think of these engineers that they heard about kids in Afghanistan that were, um, they were uh, being paid to, um, decommission landmines and it was horrible work and these kids sometimes the landmines would blow up and and so they said you know we're going to create as engineers we're creating robot technology that can dismantle that can detect and dismantle landmines so that kids don't have to do that work and also so that kids don't have to worry about playing in a field in Afghanistan and, and hitting a landmine. So, you know, I think there's so many ways um, that we can we can try to align our gifts. Um, and having said that, I think we also always got to be asking, um, where are the people that might be invisible to me, right? Because I think sometimes even in small villages, there's people that go unnoticed or there's a prison somewhere, you know, nearby that we might be able to visit. Um, so, uh, you know, just, just kind of asking those questions of who might not be on my radar that, that could be. And we've got a, a question, I suppose, that's almost the reverse of this from Michael, asking how do we get more Christians to move and live in the margins rather than staying tucked away in the suburbs or the nice villages? Yeah, well, the, 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 when, I, when I look at Jesus, um, I think this is what what discipleship is about or apprenticeship, right? Is that um, in the church, it's very clear to me that we reproduce who we are um, as leaders, as pastors, as communities. Um, it's very difficult to get the flock to do something that the the leaders are not doing, right? So, so I think some of this is about leadership and it's about example to where um, we're not going to have congregations that care about folks that are living on the streets until um, we see that kind of in the DNA of our faith and discipleship and also at all levels of our our congregation. Um, and um, so, um, yeah, and, 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 and then I think that when we live, because it is a, relationship problem more than a compassion problem um, uh, that, that we have to start somewhere, you know, and I think that's where um, they, they asked Mother Teresa, how did you manage starting all of these homes and lifting 50 million people or 50,000 people off the streets in the home for the dying, all of this work? And she said, I started with one person and we try to love one person well. And everything is sort of born out of that. And I, you know, I see that in the life of Jesus, even modeling community with 12 people um, and, and, you know, then they're pouring their lives into another, you know, 12 people maybe. And so that's how we grow the kingdom. And that's why I think Jesus often talks about it very small, 
you know, that the kingdom is like mustard seed. It, it grows like yeast. Um, it's, it's not like um, uh, this towering thing, but it, it's more uh, this wonderful image of sort of an infiltration of love um, in, in, into the world. So uh, we grow that, um, you know, very organically as a community. I think uh, your comments there actually are actually touching on this question here from Ben, but I, I imagine there's more you might want to say here. He's asking, what's been the most important thing for you in creating intentional and faith-centered community? Uh, yeah, and uh, so on this question and related to the other one is, is a friend of mine a long time ago said that the hardest part about running a marathon isn't getting to the finish line, it's getting to the starting line. Um, so really, it might feel very paralyzing to go, you know, I don't know how to start something that's reaching out to immigrants in our community. Um, how do, where do you even start? And I would say we start where people already are, right? So let's find the folks who are, are organizations that are already in relationship or better yet, led by um, immigrants. Um, and let's find folks that are already writing letters or visiting folks in, that are incarcerated and see how rather than, uh, I think sometimes we think God needs to start, start something brand new with us, right? God's got to start a new prison ministry in our church or um, something like that. And rather than seeing, you know, the world kind of revolving around us or our congregation, I think we would do well to kind of go and get involved wherever we already see those relationships happening. So, you know, in Philadelphia, what that looks like for us is um, there, there's a whole movement called the New Sanctuary Movement. And um, much of it, and th this is happening all over our country, has been led by uh, uh, immigrants and refugees, families here. So rather than starting something new, we just see, you know, how can we support what they're already doing? I mean, and, th and there's things that I wouldn't even think of. Like one of the biggest initiatives right now is around driver's licenses, because it's going to be a while before we have, you know, um, comprehensive immigration reform. I hope it happens really soon. But meanwhile, people are having their cars taken from them because they, can't get a license and they can't get, you know, it's, it's like this kind of catch 22. So being able to just have a driver's license while we're fighting for immigration reform becomes really important. And there's little things like that, that, you know, the folks who are experiencing the injustice can best lead us in figuring out um, how to address those and how to prioritize those because it can feel very overwhelming, you know, and driver licenses might not have been the first place I started, but it's also because I haven't had my car taken away because, you know, I, I got a parking ticket or something. <laughs> that is fascinating. And I, I really appreciated all the different ways last night and tonight that you're bringing through what fullness of life might look like and, and how we can get involved. And I've got a question here from Kerry where she says, why do you think that people would rather talk about life with Jesus after death rather than fullness of life both now and forever? Mm. This, is, this is a deep one, and I, I love this. I, you've got so many different questions, so thanks for asking them, everybody. It would have been a, a, a long hour with just me and Sarah here talking, but you, you're doing great, Sarah. I, I think this is a, there, there's a historic rift in all of this, I think, that, that – we've separated things that were never meant to be separated, uh, right? Like evangelism and social justice or like faith and works that the scripture is so clear that these have to go together. They're like two sides of the same coin, or I, I like the image that they're, they're like blades of scissors that have to operate together and they don't work very good on their own. Um, and yet we've pitted these things against each other that were meant to function together. And I think, you know, life before death and life after death is one of those that we can be excited about heaven, but that doesn't have to equal um, ignoring the hell on earth that many people are very experiencing. And, and, and on, on many issues that I encounter, like gun violence, for instance, many people will say, well, this is not a gun pop problem. It's not a policy problem. It's a heart problem. It's a sin problem. And I always say, why can't it be both, right? Like we, 
no law can change a violent heart or a racist heart. Um, only God can change someone's heart. And we need to recognize that this is the holy work that God's doing is personal salvation. And yet if we don't connect our person to the world we live in, like we, we miss a whole nother side of this, which is that, uh, yes, God changes hearts, but God's given us the power to change laws. And maybe we can do a better job at protecting life. And if you look at history, you, you think in the civil rights movement or the anti, you know, the abolition movement, the movement in, in Europe, like it was good for God to change racist hearts, but we also needed to restructure and realign our community uh, so that people can s swim in the same swimming pools and vote, you know, and uh, uh, go to the same schools and see each other as equal in the eyes of God. So um, that's, you know, I think that, that's kind of how I, I think a lot of our congregations, we err on one side of being, you know, as the old saying says, so heavenly minded that we're not much earthly good. Or other times, I think, working so hard to reform this world that we realize that there is a bigger story and there's there's a, a God at work in all of this. And um, we cannot just rely on our own strength um, as we try to change some of the things that are wrong in the world. So, um, and, and the last thing I'll say on it is when I look at history, I think what also happens is we overcorrect and sometimes overemphasize the parts where we've um, become imbalanced, you know, so I, I like the uh, illusion of, uh, or the illustration of, you know, if, if you kind of, your car runs off the right side of the road, or for you all, off the left side of the road, you know, you yank the wheel, and you, you yank it off the other side of the road, and some of the battle around, like, the social gospel versus the evangelical gospel, I think, kind of have that, that kind of reactionary, um, imbalance. And when you look at church history, a lot of our holes in our theology have come when we've emphasized, overemphasized one truth at the expense of another. And I think that's why we need great uh, folks that keep those integrated. And, and those have certainly been my teachers, folks like Tony Campolo or Ron Sider and um, Rene Padilla, who, you know, we just lost, who, uh, you know, came up with this whole concept of integral mission where social justice and evangelism not only can go together, but have to go together. Absolutely. A great loss indeed. You've, uh, you've made a reference there to to the, the bringing together of uh, God changing people's hearts and also actually us working perhaps to try and change laws or change the way society's thinking. And we've got a question from Neil saying, how can we protest well? Mm, yeah. Well, the, for, there's, there's, this is a big question. And I, I guess um, when it, I, I really like how um, uh, Brian uh, McLaren has said, sometimes we, we need to protest and other times we need to protestify, you know, that we need to proclaim not only the, the things that are wrong, but how we can imagine a world that's right. I like the power of that. I, I mean, I think that there is an absolute need to be in the streets, to raise our voices and join our voices with those who are crying out that Black Lives Matter, that um, um, I can't breathe, you know, the, the, the cry of, and the groaning of our countries and of our world. Um, and yet in a lot of these movements, part of what I see is this proclamation that uh, it doesn't have to be this way, right? And it seems like before every social movement that has changed the world, everyone says it's impossible. And after those social movements, everyone looks back and says it was inevitable. And the role of the church, I believe, um, as Martin Luther King said it so well, is not meant to be the master of the state or the servant of the state, but the church is meant to be the conscience of the state. And, and isn't that another beautiful place that the Baptist Assembly can be that prophetic conscience in our countries um, to where uh, we, we amplify the voices of those who are not being heard. And, and, and um, 
and, and standing alongside those who are hurting. I think that's part of the prophetic call of the church is to stir people's hearts. And, and Dr. King, um, you know, did this so well. And he, and he, and he said that our job is to expose injustice so that it becomes so uncomfortable that people can't help but respond. And, you know, I, I can't, remember if I mentioned this and you're going to hear, I think another talk from me tomorrow, you might be tired of me by the end of the weekend. But one of the ways that we did that in Philadelphia was um, we had so many lives that were being lost to heroin um, and to drug addiction that we wanted to raise our voices and say, this is a, this is a national emergency. This is not just something we need to debate in city council meetings. Like we need an emergency response. And really prompted by the the young people in our neighborhood we gathered the heroin needles from around our parks and our sidewalks and we put them in jars and my wife uh, uh, helped organize all this we put epoxy in them and uh, packaged them up so that they would be safe and then we put some of the quotes from the young people and it was actually the young people that delivered these to the mayor and to the council members and to the public health commissioner and the people in our city. And what it did was it it humanized the thousand lives that have been lost in our city every year to drug addiction. And one of our council members said he put this on the shelf of his office to continually remind him of the humanity behind this. And, and it wasn't long before our city declared heroin addiction, a public health crisis, and begin to address some of this, I think can still do a whole lot more. But all that to say, like, whatever it is that is hurting people in your city or in your village, um, our job is to um, stir people's hearts with compassion. And sometimes we got to be creative. Uh, Most of the protests that we're doing these days, we try to get really creative. Um, And uh, because I think holding signs does something. And there's there's a uh, certainly a history of, you know, being in the streets with signs, you know, holding signs that say, I am a man, I am human, you know, th- that has power. Uh, and I think we also got to keep finding new ways that we can imagine what it looks like to protest or protestify. I absolutely love that example. And I can imagine how powerful it was handing over those jars. Um, Mm. We're coming into our last five minutes, so let me just say if you're watching, this is probably your last chance to get your questions in. We've got time for a couple more. Um, And in fact, touching on on what you've just been talking about, we've got uh, somebody called Norman who is asking to understand a bit more about how you um, respond to those struggling with addiction, uh, what it looks like to perhaps welcome them into the community um, with all the, the facets around that. Yeah, totally. totally. Um, So one of the, the, when it comes to this idea that, I mean, it's kind of been a theme that in our conversation in the, 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 this dialogue has been um, that, that this is personal, but it's also social. And I think we have to think of addiction as in in the drug economy as that too. Um, And um, we can't just address the symptoms without addressing addressing the disease, right? And some of this is an economy that replaced the uh, factory jobs that we had in North Philadelphia. So we've lost 100,000 jobs. We've got 700 abandoned factories. And it's no coincidence that one of the replacement, replacement industries that's come in that is now one of the largest economies in, in North Philadelphia is heroin. And uh, there's an incredible article on Kensington, on our neighborhood in the New New York Times called The Walmart of Heroin. And it shows how pervasive the drug economy is. And I think seeing it as an economy that is exploitive and so damaging um, and and deadly is is really important because we can't just tell kids on the corner not to sell drugs unless we create some alternative economy, right, to, to how people can make it. So in Philadelphia, one of the bright lights is a, is a recovery community called New Jerusalem. And you can, it's on, you can find them on the internet, newjerusalemnow.org. Uh, although they're, they're not, they don't spend a lot of time on the internet. They're, you know, in their community and in in, in, in helping each other recover. But on the wall um, at New Jerusalem, there's a quote that says, 
we cannot fully recover until we help the world that made us sick recover. So that's a powerful statement, right? That this is about personal recovery and any recovery community has a, you know, an amazing uh, process of, like the 12 steps and things that are ways of healing from that. Uh, I think the best recovery communities are led by people in advanced recovery, wounded healers. You know, the best person to help someone come off heroin is someone that's been in, you know, sober for five years. The best person to help someone come out of domestic violence is someone who uh, has experienced and survived that. So I think we've got to see people who are, who are survivors as some of the most incredible parts of our community, right? Are people whose wounds and the things that they've survived give them a certain compassion and a certain wisdom about helping other folks, right? So the folks that set the rules um, around heroin are folks that are in advanced recovery. It's not outsiders or this kind of outside paradigm that's imposed on the community, but it comes from within the community in this sense of wounded healers. So it's not outside professional social workers that are policing the community, but it's actually the people themselves that know what it takes to recover and they know when to break their own rules, right? And when to show grace to someone that um, has struggled. So I, I really trust that community. And when we have folks that aren't familiar, for instance, with heroin, that are trying to do hospitality to folks who are addicted to heroin, that's a really, really hard task. So I think we need the wisdom of folks that um, know how to create an environment, as Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker said, we've got to create an environment where it's easier to be good. And there's things that we might just not think about, you know, that someone who is addicted to a drug that only needs maybe two or three dollars, five dollars um, for that addiction, um, you know, leaving a wallet or a cell phone on the counter might not think, you know, you might not think twice about that, but if that becomes coupled with the monster of addiction, I think we, 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 that it's really a difficult thing, right? So I think we need that communal wisdom together. Um, and, and we've made a lot of mistakes <laughs> and we've, we've fallen forward, you know, we've kept kind of learning as we, as we try to show hospitality, but we can have better wisdom and not have to make all of our own mistakes by, you know, partnering, uh, especially with something like recovery with someone with, with a community that has been doing recovery for a long time. And personally, I think the entire church can benefit immensely by the model of recovery and wounded healers and Alcoholics Anonymous and so many of the things that um, create that vulnerability that we actually try to hide in a lot of the church. And some of the questions have alluded to that. You know, we tend to um, make it look like we we all have it together. And I think we would do a lot better if we, we led from a place that um, ha has room for brokenness and for struggle and doubt. And um, like uh, one of the churches I attended, they, the, the people greeting the folks coming in at the door, uh, instead of shirts and suits and ties, they had t-shirts on that said, no perfect people allowed. <laughs> and that that kind of sets the bar right you know right so, so like no perfect people out you are welcome to our church as long as you know you don't have all your stuff together right and uh come in with that posture uh or as you know my friend tony Kempo, he says uh, when people tell him the church is full of hypocrites he says no it's not we've always got room for more <laughs> so that that's i think the the kind of uh ethos we need in the church that is fantastic. That, that takes us to out of time, I am afraid. But thank you so much for sharing all that with us. We, we have thrown some tricky questions at you there. I just wonder, the last thing is, could you tell us how we can pray for you and your community? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and first of all, you can follow our community at the simple way, the simple way.org. And you can follow all of our other work, you know, the work I'm doing around the country with Red Letter Christians at redletterchristians.org or in the UK, Red Letter Christians. I think it's .org.uk because uh, there's a really beautiful thing happening over there. And as far as praying for us, I think uh, you can be praying for Katie and I as we, you know, enter into the, the we just celebrated 10 years of, of, of being married and 
we're asking the exciting and daunting question of what's the next chapter of this look like for us, you know, and how does our work in Philly fit into that? How does our love for our families down in Tennessee and North Carolina and the other stuff happening around the country? So I think that, you know, that's, uh, that's how you can be praying for me. And I'd love, I, I do my best to keep in touch with folks on, uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook. So please do keep us in your prayers. And I hope uh, soon I can be over there in, you know, in real time and space in person with you all at the Baptist Assembly. But this has been really wonderful to join you virtually. And I'll I'll get to be with you again tomorrow. But um, thank you, Sarah, so much for the conversation this hour problem at all and I'm sure we can drop a link for the simple way into the chat. Thank you and we look forward to hearing from you again tomorrow. Absolutely. So, Thank you all. <laughs> Take care. So folks please do remember Shane as you're praying and, uh, and, and be thinking of him as he wrestles with some of those decisions. That's it from us here today, but we look forward to seeing you tomorrow, 10.30, as we join together in worship. And I pray you have a really blessed evening, um, an evening of reflection and relaxation, and look forward to seeing you in the morning. Take care.